Josh Taylor versus Jose Ramirez. Let's talk about the fight. Ahead of this fight, there really were no wrong answers. Ahead of the fight, before the match actually took place, you couldn't have faulted anyone for going with Josh Taylor. You couldn't have faulted anyone for going with Jose Ramirez. Seemed like a 50-50 fight. A lot of late money pouring in for Jose Ramirez, who was the slight underdog just before the fight. With the bookies. Myself, I decided to go with Josh Taylor in what I viewed as a 50-50 fight on the premise of star signs, because that's how close a fight it was to me in my eyes, ahead of the fight. Capricornian power aside, the school of thought was that here you have two very good mid-range to inside punchers. Two guys who are very statuesque for this weight, statuesque for junior welterweight, with the difference being that one of them has more ways of fighting a fight, thus more ways of winning a fight. That fighter is Josh Taylor. They're both big for this weight. They're both durable. They're both unbeaten. But what sets them apart is Josh Taylor's ring savvy. It really is Josh Taylor's ring IQ. That separates them. How is Taylor going to approach this fight? Is he going to try to mix it up with the, with Ramirez? In and Ramirez out. Is off. In, and in and out. out. In and out. In and because okay. that's what he has. That's what he has on Ramirez. Ramirez is very good on the front foot, very good in the pocket when he's coming forward. Whereas Josh, he's good coming forward. He's good on the front foot too, but he has the option of getting out. He's got more bounce, more pep in his step, and he could fight moving laterally more than Jose. Jose is not no back foot, use the ring type of fighter. He's a come forward, aggressive, mid-range to inside puncher. What saves Josh is that he's a good mid-range to inside puncher, and he throws shorter punches than Jose. Don't be surprised if Jose get dropped. I ain't going to yeah, say but... he get knocked out, but don't be surprised if he get yeah, dropped. Yeah, because, because the way that Josh... The, the way is, that Josh like to, the way that Josh like to come in, he like to come in with short hooks or short uppercuts. Those anecdotes, that prediction was imparted just before the fight, during the card, as the card started, as Elvis Rodriguez suffered his first professional loss, and as Jose Zapata was given that gift over Hank Lundy, Undy, who I Undy. think did enough to win that fight, but not enough for the judges. Welcome to boxing. The upset win for Kenny Sims Jr. should have been followed by the upset win of Hank Lundy over Jose Zapata, who did not look himself out there. It looked like he left some piece of himself way back there in that Baranchik fight, though. That's another story for another day. My view of Taylor versus Ramirez was it's an even fight where there is no wrong answer until the fight is over. Though my pony in the show was Josh Taylor on the premise that not only is he a little better on the inside than Jose Ramirez, he can box from the outside as well. That one of these two guys is more than just a puncher, is more than just an inside fighter, and that guy is Josh Taylor, and that's what we saw in last night's contest. A contest that got off to a really good start for Jose Ramirez. Strong showing in the beginning. It did look like a fight that was very much up for grabs in the first quarter of the fight, the first couple of rounds. Strong showing from... Jose Ramirez, you notice that Josh Taylor was making a conscious effort to go to Jose's body. Early. Body shots in the early rounds pay dividends in the latter rounds, the latter stages of the match. And you saw Josh Taylor put a lot of shots downstairs on Jose Ramirez, trying to take the steam out of that guy, trying to take the fight out of that guy. I think that caught up to Jose. I think those body shots from Josh Taylor, well-placed body shots in the beginning of the fight, allowed the pace to finally get to Jose Ramirez, who noticeably slowed in the mid-portion of the match after he'd been knocked down at least once, two times overall. I think it was all downhill after the first one. An exquisite pull counter in the corner off of the left hand. You had Jose Ramirez coming forward, and he got caught. Caught right in the sweet spot, right on the kisser. The aesthetic of the match really changed after that. It was in the sixth round. The first knockdown was... The second knockdown came in the seventh round. These two guys were mid-range to inside. Within striking distance of each other. And Jose Ramirez, needless to say, had a lapse of judgment, a defensive lapse in judgment that Josh Taylor capitalized. They don't tell you to protect yourself at all times for nothing. Josh Taylor landed a very short uppercut that floored Jose Ramirez. And if you ask me, you know I've seen fights stop for less than what Jose Ramirez suffered at the hands of 
Josh Taylor in the seventh round. I mean, I really have. I have seen fights stopped for a lot less than what we saw in the seventh round of last night's fight. The second time Jose Ramirez got dropped, he struggled to get up. His equilibrium was clearly off. And if I didn't know better, I'd say that Kenny Bayless gave Jose Ramirez special consideration, special outs. treatment, maybe a little bit more time to recover. Because when this guy picked himself up off the deck, he was asked to come forward by Kenny. I don't know. It looked like he stumbled. And as stated, I have seen fights stop for less than what Jose Ramirez endured leading up to the seventh round and in the seventh round. He got dropped in the sixth, dropped again in the seventh, picks himself up. His equilibrium is off. He's stumbling a bit. Kenny gives him the benefit of the doubt, allows the fight to go on, and Josh Taylor fires punishing salvos that Jose Ramirez did his best to try and endure, though it was clear that Jose Ramirez was in a bad way, and Kenny let the fight go on. I thought the fight should have been stopped right then and there. I've seen fights stopped for less. I don't know. For whatever reason, maybe Kenny Bayless was feeling extra generous that night. Must have. Decided to give Jose Ramirez the crowd favorite the benefit of the doubt for the crowd's sake. Key components in the match. Key elements of the fight. You'll notice how Josh Taylor used his lead hand. Josh Taylor, who's a southpaw that leads with his right, you'll notice how he employed that lead right hand. He didn't simply fire piston-like jabs on Jose Ramirez. Not just. What you got from Josh was a lot more nuanced, a lot more subtle. He was using that lead hand as both a probing lead hand and a range finder to line up his shots, line up the straight left hand. You saw that Josh was kind of just floating that lead hand out there and purposely touching Jose Ramirez on the gloves with it. He wasn't firing that lead hand. He wasn't wasting punches on Jose Ramirez's high guard. He was tapping him. Touching him. Touching his gloves with that lead hand. Kind of like what you see from Vasil Lomachenko in the lightweight division to where he throws these pity pat punches, these decoy punches. To distract the guy. Punches that purposefully don't got a lot on them. They're not intended to. They are intended to service as both distractions and deterrents. How so? You see Josh touching Jose on the gloves. That's intended to keep Jose's hands high as he comes forward. Hands high and guns holstered. Oh. You're touching this guy on the gloves so that as he's coming forward, he stays in that high guard and he don't throw because he's worried you might throw that straight left hand. So you tap him on the gloves as he's coming forward. And that'll force him to keep those hands high. And keep those guns holstered as he's attempting to come forward while Josh... Josh keeps Jose distracted, angling himself for the right shot. Could be a body shot, could be a shot upstairs, could be an uppercut that splits the guard. But the usage of the lead hand is what makes this possible. The nuanced usage of Josh Taylor's lead hand. He's not just firing jabs, telegraph jabs that Jose Ramirez would expect. Jabs that likely would land on Jose Ramirez's arms and gloves. He's not just shooting jabs out there. He's floating the lead hand. Touching Jose with it. Just touching him with it. Don't confuse that for wasting punches. Not wasting punches. He's firing short decoy shots, distractions, to both keep Jose Ramirez's guns holstered and allow Josh enough time to line up the next power shot. Decoy punches by way of the lead hand were a key component in this match. Short shots, short uppercuts, and short hooks on the inside were another key component. Understand that both Jose Ramirez and Josh Taylor, the both of them, they both got the same sweet spot. That's mid-range to inside, but one of these guys is a lot more crafty than the other. And that guy's Josh Taylor. Oh. The second knockdown off what was a very short uppercut. The first knockdown. That left hand pull counter. One thing that distinguishes Josh Taylor from Jose Ramirez is that Josh Taylor doesn't need as much room as Jose to generate power. Oh. This is a guy who really drives his punches, drives whatever he throws and turns himself into those shots. That's why he's able to generate so much power within close proximity of his opponent. In this case, Jose Ramirez. Josh generates a lot of power short distance. Whereas Jose throws wider shots and needs more space to put something on those shots. More space to generate power. Josh Taylor, he can fight in a phone booth and generate power. Oh. That is one glaring distinction between them. That Josh can fight in the phone booth and generate power. That was evident in the second knockdown off that lead uppercut in the seventh round. Not only was that a testament to Josh Taylor's power deep, deep in the pocket, it was also a testament to the dog that he has in him. 
Josh Taylor isn't just an educated boxer. This is a guy that likes the tear-ups. He likes to throw. He likes the Donnie Brooks. He likes the dust-up. Yeah. He lives for this stuff. He's the kind of guy you can't take your eyes off this guy for a second, because any opportunity you give him, he's going to try to capitalize on it. That was evident in the knockdown in the seventh round. His craftiness was evident in the sixth. Off of that left-handed pull counter. We've talked about decoy punches. We've talked about power at short range. The ability to set traps was yet another key component, another key element of this fight. And setting traps has everything to do with ring savvy. It's one of those things where maybe it can't be taught. Maybe it's one of those things that you can't teach so much as it develops over time naturally, fight by fight, based on the fighter's instincts. Knowing what opportunities to capitalize on and forecasting movement in order to produce a result. Josh Taylor's not restricted to coming forward to fight his fight. I talked about this. He's got in and out and Jose doesn't. In and out game. The ability to get within range and get out of range. But not just get in and out. Get in, do the business, and get out safely. That is a testament to Josh Taylor's athleticism, his movement, his movement, which allows him to set up traps like backing himself into a corner and walking Jose Ramirez into a pull counter. Oh. It was the first knockdown of the fight we saw. Jose Ramirez gave a spirited effort. Jose showed a lot of toughness surviving those two knockdowns and finishing this fight on his feet. He did. This really was Josh Taylor's night. An excellent display of boxing from the Tartan Tornado was now the newly crowned undisputed junior welterweight champion the world's his oyster right now and he deserves it congratulations to him just like that the conversation of what's next for josh taylor here we go it's already started it's already begun i'm hearing names thrown around like javante davis names like teofimo lopez Regis Prograrius immediately expressed an interest in having a rematch with Josh Taylor. There's that to consider. Josh Taylor himself fancies a Terrence Crawford fight, a move upstairs to become a two-division champion, or try to. And that's a lengthy conversation in it of itself. It really is. Mikey Garcia even expressed an interest in, in facing Josh Taylor, which took me by surprise because it was Mikey Garcia himself that said, if Josh wins, it's a difficult situation because Josh is with top rank. He said it. I mean, if what you're wondering right now is what's likelier than not for Josh Taylor and what's next, I'll tell you right now, people need to stop tacking on the name of Javante Davis with these fighters that ain't TMT fighters and ain't PBC fighters because he ain't going to fight none of those fucking fighters. So why people are still doing that here today is beyond me. Don't hold your breath waiting for Davis versus Taylor. The only reason that Javante Davis is up there at 140 is because they don't want to make fights with the guys at 130 or 135. And what they're waiting for is for Josh Taylor to move up so that Davis can pick up a vacant title. He's fighting Barrios for a baby belt. If he wins that baby belt and Josh Taylor moves up to 147, Davis will be in line to be elevated to WBA full champion. They didn't move up there looking for a fight with the winner of this fight. They're just positioning themselves to pick up a vacant title. That's it. Davis versus Taylor don't happen. Lopez versus Taylor, well, it's a little bit more likely than Davis versus Taylor, though I question how much of a priority is it to Josh to make that fight? How much of a priority is it to top rank? to make that fight. I think there's money in the fight. I think it's a fight that could get attention, but I don't think it's a lot. Josh Taylor himself expressed an interest in moving up in weight and facing Terrence Crawford after this. Bob Arum, post-fight, he said that fight could happen as soon as October. And given the scarcity of opponent options Terrence Crawford has been facing the last couple of years as a welterweight, it might be imperative to the people over their top rank to make a fight for Terrence as soon as possible. Teofimo, having did what he did. You know. The purse demands, the purse bid, his next fight ending up on Triller. Who knows if the people over there at top rank don't still feel raw about that. Who knows if he hasn't fallen out of favor as a result of that situation. That being said, Lopez versus Taylor is more possible than Davis versus Taylor, though neither one are a lot. Mikey Garcia, he's a guy who can't make up his mind. Before the fight, he says that fighting Taylor would be a problem because he's with top rank. Well, he's still with top rank. But post-fight, he expressed an interest in fighting that guy. And I'm not against that fight. I'm really not. I'd love to see Garcia versus Taylor. I would. But given the kind of money that, you know, Mikey wants to make for a fight and the fact that top rank, they ain't in the business of overpaying fighters. They ain't in the business of giving money away. And his history with top rank, the fact that he fought so hard 
to get out of that contract, to get away from that situation. As much as I would like to see Garcia versus Taylor, I hold my breath. Regis Prograrius, immediately after the fight, expressed an interest in a rematch. And, and Josh Taylor, being the kind of fighter that he is, the kind of guy he is, I don't think the idea of a rematch bothers him. It's just that he has bigger fish to fry. What does he gain from fighting Regis Prograrius for a second time? What's in it for him? Nothing. And does Josh Taylor stick around this division long enough to satisfy his mandatory challenger, Jack Catterall, who stepped aside so that this fight could happen on the premise that he'd get the winner. Will he? Will Josh Taylor honor that engagement, if I'm being honest? I don't think so. I'm not convinced that he will. And maybe that's better for Jack, because I don't give Jack any kind of odds to beat Josh Taylor, if I'm being honest. It might be more beneficial to Jack that Josh not honor that engagement, because Jack is in a pole position to challenge for the title. If Josh moves up and the WBO title goes vacant, what could happen is Jack will get to fight somebody for it. Yeah, somebody. Somebody who's nowhere near as good as Josh. And, and maybe Jack Catterall can see himself becoming the next WBO champion. I mean, maybe Jack wants the fight. Maybe it's the fight that Jack wants. But even if he doesn't get it, there's a silver lining. There's a silver lining for Jack Catterall. Javante Davis, Mikey Garcia, Regis Prograrius, Teofimo Lopez, Terrence Crawford. Out of that short list of names, I'd say that Terrence Crawford is likelier than not to get the fight. I think the two likeliest guys to get the fight, you know, maybe it's Lopez, maybe it's Lopez, but he comes in behind Terrence Crawford. I think uh, Terrence Crawford is the front runner to face Josh Taylor next. Undisputed versus undisputed. There's just so much those guys have in common. Their tenacity, their temperament, their nuance. These are special fighters, very special fighters. Special fighters that have a dog in them. Special fighters that are skilled fighters, but have a characteristic mean streak. An excellent fucking fight.